David Davenport from the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual briefing. We have a good number of folks joining us today, so to keep background noise at a minimum, we ask that you please mute your own line and please do not put us on hold. When we move to the discussion, if you would like to comment or ask a question, we invite you to unmute your line at that time. Finally, today's briefing is being recorded, and if you have any technical issues, please contact Lindsay Stevens via email at lstevens at personalizedmedicinecoalition.org or through the chat feature in the webinar. Now I'll turn it over to PMC's president, Edward Abrahams, to kick us off. Thank you very much, David. Uh, my name is Edward Abrahams, and I am president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. The purpose of today's briefing on COVID-19 and personalized medicine, which is organized by the newly formed Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus, is to explore first the status of emerging COVID-19 diagnostics and treatments through the lens of personalized medicine in order to learn how personalized medicine can contribute to our understanding of the current crisis. Second, to understand how emerging science and technology underpinning personalized medicine can inform developing new diagnostics and treatment modalities. As we will hear for a moment from Senator Scott, it is in fact continued investment in science and technology that is going to help us resolve the greatest healthcare challenge we have faced in perhaps 100 years. And third, we want to know what public policies are going to help improve preparedness for pandemics like the one we are facing today. The Personalized Medicine Coalition, a multi-stakeholder education and advocacy organization, was created to tackle issues like these. Though I must say, we had no idea we would be facing one as severe as this. We are therefore delighted that Representatives Swalwell and Emmer, Senator Scott and Cinema, have organized a Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus to convene meetings like this so we can understand the full dimensions of the current challenge and our opportunities to address it. I would now like to introduce Cynthia Benz, PMC Senior Vice President for Public Policy, who in addition to bringing 14 distinct stakeholder groups in healthcare around a common vision, is also responsible for helping persuade policymakers to make the necessary changes that will facilitate the development of a new paradigm in medicine that promises not only better outcomes for patients, but also a more efficient delivery of healthcare in the future. Cynthia. Great. Thank you so much, Ed, for the very kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we understand that, um, particularly on the Hill, it is um, an extremely busy time. Before I get into my speaker introductions and framing for the panel, um, I'm actually going to pause um, and allow some time for some uh, brief remarks from one of the Congressional Personalized Medicine um, Caucus co-chairs, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. Thank you all for being here today. I'm grateful to be able to co-chair the Bipartisan Personalized Medicine Caucus in the Senate with my good friend, Senator Sinema. And it almost goes without saying that the work of this caucus has never been more essential. COVID-19 has posed unprecedented challenges. The pandemic has also ushered in an unprecedented wave of innovation. From novel vaccine platforms to groundbreaking diagnostic tools and game-changing therapies, some of which leverage existing technology in new ways, we've seen a staggering all-hands-on-deck mobilization of the private sector working in partnership with some of our most versatile agents. Through these collaborations, we're seeing the development and broad scale protection needed to prevent, identify, and treat the COVID-19 virus. We're also seeing the creation and deployment of technologies that will transform the diagnostic, immunization, and treatment landscape for years to come. And personalized medicine has been front and center as these efforts move forward. Across the board, personalized medicine is driving the development of precise, high quality, and cost effective tools. And in spite of the disruptions that the pandemic has triggered when it comes to clinical trials and therapy development, we're seeing lightning fast progress on gene and cell boundaries, along with other personalized medicine, both in our response to COVID 19 and in our continued efforts to facilitate innovation across the board. Personalized medicine has a vital role to play in advancing life-saving tools and treatments. 
Thank you all for your interest in this essential issue, and God bless. We also expect um, Representative Swalwell to join us, and it sounds like he has just called in. So, uh, Congressman Swalwell uh, from California, thanks so much for taking the time to stop in and for making the briefing possible today. Uh, of course, uh, and, and thank you so much. And, and I want to thank uh, Adiola on my team, uh, who you know continues to help us uh, lead uh, the caucus. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, some of the guests on the call. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abrahams, uh, the president of the Personalized Medicine uh, Coalition. Uh, Cynthia Benz, of course, thank you again uh, for what you're doing. Mark Stevenson uh, at Thermo Fisher for your, your presence uh, in our district uh, and just uh, worldwide. Uh, and of course, uh, Rajiv uh, Venkaya, uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, Venkaya. So you know, when we first started laying the groundwork for this uh, Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus, bipartisan caucus, we barely could have imagined uh, the circumstances we'd be in today. We, we understood uh, that precision medicine, uh, you know, would play a big role if something like this ever happened, but certainly uh, none of us uh, who gather, uh, you know, for uh, the launch of the caucus imagined uh, what was uh, ahead. And a global pandemic like COVID-19, uh, which has claimed more than half a million lives around the world, and, you know, we're near 130,000 uh, in America, it, it really underscores the need to bring personalized medicine to everyone uh, without delay. And we're seeing that a one-size-fits-all approach is no better for COVID uh, than it is for cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer, or any other uh, illness. And so there's really good reason, uh, in my view, uh, and from our staff's perspective, to believe that genetic and genomic testing combined with attention to each patient's circumstances, their values, and medical history that can help us reduce deaths and permanent disabilities uh, that COVID-19 uh, continues to bring. So in Congress, I think we have to be flexible and forward-looking enough to enact policies that pave the way for this, not just for COVID, but also for the next pandemic uh, as we uh, are you know, preparing for that. And uh, you know, many of you probably saw uh, that while it's a flu, uh, that there, there is a uh, fear of a, a new flu coming out uh, of China. It just reminds us that uh, you know, we will continue to see, uh, you know, viruses uh, and flus, uh, you know, coming uh, from all over the world and that there's so much that we have to do in, in what we invest uh, in research uh, in the United States uh, about what we know about our, our bodies, how we can distribute uh, therapies and vaccines uh, will go a very, very long way. And I'm heartened that uh, as tense as it is in Washington, D.C., and, and I would be lying to you if I said that uh, this hasn't been one of the most challenging times uh, that we still find uh, bipartisanship on the issue of precision medicine. And so that really is a, a testament to uh, the Personalized Medicine Caucus and, and, and obviously the work that the coalition uh, is doing. So I, I just want to thank you for your work. We need you more than ever. And thank you especially uh, to our scientists. Uh, my message uh, to every high school uh, and middle school class that I've spoken to uh, is that uh, this has to be a uh, learning opportunity for you. As difficult as it is, uh, we know you're resilient. We know you'll come out of this uh, stronger, uh, but you really have to learn from this uh, and apply what you've learned uh, as you go into uh, your careers. And I hope that the next generation uh, really has this mantra of never again can we be so ill-prepared uh, for a pandemic and always uh, will we trust public health, invest in science, uh, and listen to experts. So thank you all for what you're doing, and uh, I'll, I'll stay on the call and uh, continue to get an update as to what's going on in the field. Great. Thank you so much, Congressman Falwell. And uh, we did want to say that it was um, your and Adiola's idea to um, initiate this briefing. So we appreciate it so much because this really turned into um, a very timely and important conversation to have. Okay, for those of you who participated in the uh, February Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus briefing we had, um, you may recall that one of the areas that was highlighted by Lance Baldo, the Chief Medical Officer of Adaptive Biotechnologies, was the potential for personalized medicine interventions in infectious diseases. And I think that um, any of us that were in that room, um, we couldn't have guessed that um, just less than a month later, uh, we'd all be confined to our houses in uh, an effort to control an infectious disease that wasn't well understood. Um, and that we'd be discussing soon in, in the very same forum, uh, just virtually, um, how to accelerate progress in personalized medicine and the infectious disease. 
Um, we are so grateful uh, to the Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus for proposing this briefing. Um, you suggested some terrific speakers and also um, just the effort that you and your staff went through to, to co-host and participate in this with the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Um, everyone who's spoken so far um, has recognized that, that we are really facing a, a significant public health challenge in this country. Um, and many say it's the greatest challenge that we faced in more than 100 years. Um, it's really critical to bring not only the best minds that we have, but all the technologies that we have to bear to fully understand how the virus is causing our COVID-19 spread from person to person, uh, why people's response to the virus is so variable, and how uh, people become immune to it. Well, I know what drives me and my colleagues at the Personalized Medicine Coalition is knowing that through science, we really do have an opportunity to prevail over diseases and to improve people's health. And this virus is really no exception for us. Uh, the title of the briefing is the Personalized Medicine Community's Response to COVID-19. Um, the speakers that are going to be presenting today um, aren't going to be able to reflect in every way that the personalized medicine community has stepped up to meet the challenges posed by COVID-19. Um, it's really been tremendous for us to see just within TMP membership how um, so many folks have shifted gears um, to really be part of the rapid response to the virus. Um, our speakers do have broad perspectives to share in two areas. Um, the first is on diagnostic testing, and the other is on vaccine and therapeutic development. Uh, both of these areas are critical to an effective long-term strategy for safely reopening the country, and we feel very fortunate to have them. Um, so next slide, please, Lindsay. So with that, um, I have the pleasure of introducing our, our first uh, presenter today. It's Mark Stevenson. Um, Mark is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Thermo Fisher Scientific. He served in that role since August of 2017 and he has the responsibility for the company's life sciences, analytical instruments, laboratory products, and specialty diagnostics businesses, as well as the company's innovation and digital strategy. And he joined the company as executive vice president and president of Life Science Solutions through the acquisition of Life Technologies. He's previously served as president and chief operating officer of Life Technologies and president and chief operating officer of Applied Biosciences prior to its merger with InVitroGen. Mark received his MBA from the Henley Management School and his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Reading, both are in the UK. Um, but we've had the real pleasure of getting to know Mark uh, through his service on the Personalized Medicine Coalition Board of Directors. Uh, we all look forward to hearing what he has to say today about the current diagnostic landscape for COVID-19. So with that, I'm gonna ask Lindsay to pull up your slides and uh, Mark, if you can take yourself off of mute, I'm turning the call over to you. Thank you, uh, Cynthia, and thank you both to the PMC and to the, uh, the caucus here to have the opportunity of this briefing. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is, is the response that has been incredibly intense over the last three months. Uh, it feels like longer, feels like a year or more, and I'll talk about my view on the next three months, which normally you might say is a very short period, but I actually think we have a very important time ahead of us to make the right decisions over the next three months uh, so we can get the country moving back again. And longer term, we have to make the considerations. This period has been one of collaboration across industries, uh, across pharmaceutical, across diagnostics, but also very much with government. And so government policy is absolutely at the center of this, and so I appreciate the opportunity today. Go to the next slide. So from the point of Thermo Fisher, our passion is actually our mission statement. And our mission statement is all about making the world healthier, cleaner, and safer through our customers. And this time of COVID, the response of our colleagues, 75,000 colleagues around the world, could not have been more important to mobilize in different areas, whether that's been supporting diagnostics I'll talk about today, be that development of new vaccines and therapies with our partners, helping them everything from the raw materials through to fill and finish of the vaccines we hope are coming and you're going to hear about, making hand sanitizer, remaking our factories that otherwise made lab chemicals into making hand sanitizers, and then all the personal protective equipment we've been supplying. So let me uh, go to the next slide. To give you an outside snapshot of where we are, so we very much on innovation, and we focus this innovation currently into COVID. Uh, we had a large install base of our genetic analyzers, and early on in January, February, when we had the first virus sequence, 
We made an assay that was available uh, that we then got approval through the FDA in the UA in early March. And our focus over the last three months has been really scaling those tests so that we could meet the demand. And I'll talk about that to you. One of the key advantages we've had is working in a vertically integrated way, but we've really had tremendous support across the world to work and scale this response that we've had to do to get the testing up to an unparalleled level. You have the next slide. So I should first ground you in the types of testing that we have. So you hear a lot about the molecular test, which is really testing at the RNA level and typically using PCR testing you'll hear. Uh, people have started using swabs that are at the back of the nose and throat, but you also start to see innovations using saliva. This is typically going on in labs, but you're also beginning to see point of care innovation. And I'll talk in the next slide where this is used, but typically this is used to diagnose the infection. You'll also hear about antigen tests, uh, which are also detecting uh, to look at the uh, infection. Um, but more often what you'll hear is antibody tests or serology, which are trying to answer the question, has someone had the infection and looking for antibodies? Uh, ideally, from that, you'd be able to determine, do they have immunity? Unfortunately, at that point, we're still unknown, and there's a lot of research studies to be done to understand what is the immune response going on to the reaction, and how might we test for that? So the next slide, to give you a little more graphical view on this, if you look at the green line after infection, the infection produces in the patient a virus. And in that incubation period, before you see symptoms, that's when the PCR test in green can be begin to detect it. We're detecting 10 copies of the virus. Typically, when we see a patient infected in hospital, they'll have thousands, 10,000 copies of the virus. And then that decays after a few weeks. You see up the antibody response and also initial antibodies and then later antibodies. Unfortunately, why this virus is spread is about 35% is the latest education or estimation from the CDC that patients don't actually see symptoms. And that's a very important point. In other cases where we see spread of viruses and the symptoms are there, we'll test on symptom. But in the case of some of the testing here, we're testing on viral load before people have symptoms or when they have symptoms. And I'll come back to why that's an important point. Some of you may have read over the weekend, there was a New York Times article on this, on the importance of between infection and symptom onset and how this disease is spread. So let me turn to the next slide and, and give you a quick snapshot of where we were at the beginning of the outbreak. So when we started the outbreak here back in February, you know, in the U.S., some people might argue it was coming in the U.S. earlier than that. Uh, but at least in that period of time, there was only one test, which was the CDC test. They had the samples. They were the one authorized by the FDA. But quickly when we got changes by the FDA policies that allowed this emergency authorization, then by the end of March, we had more than 22 different types of molecular tests from industry scaling up. If you look today, the total testing that's gone on in the U.S., we're currently testing about 600,000 in a three-day rolling testing average. That's reached a kind of new plateau of testing. And the important thing we need to look at is also a discrepancy between what the test capacity is, for example, if you're sitting in Boston when the testing rate, compared to where you are in Florida, is important because it comes back to what is the capacity and how do we match capacity for the turnaround time that we need, ideally, to get tests done within a 24-hour, 48-hour period in order to do track and trace. Now, as well, there are serology tests out there. Initially, in many serology tests, we found issues with sensitivity and specificity, so we've tightened some of the rules, or the FDA has done, which I think is the right thing. But we still struggle because some patients don't produce an immune response, at least in the, this IgG, IgM. And, and so therefore, we've continued to 
need more studies in what is this immune response and how do we use the serology to look at prevalence. For example, you may have seen New York just published maybe slightly less than 20% from their studies have currently had the disease according to the serology tests. People sometimes talk about herd immunity, which at least should mean more than 50 or 60% in that case. Go to the next slide, please. So some of the industry response has also been solving some very practical bottlenecks. So, you know, this scale of testing uh, turned out that we didn't have enough swabs in the world. These are a small swab, much as you may use to a cotton swab, and there was one type. So it's been very helpful to have government step in, in this case the DOD, a warder uh, through the Defense Production Act, a small company was making these uh, swabs uh, Puritan to scale up massively. So that was a very important response. Secondly, you need to transport the swabs to the labs. These were things actually that Thomas Fisher made. And similarly, we were awarded a grant to take our factory in Lenexa in Kansas to scale that up. And we'll start making actually July 4th here for HHS up to 170 million viral transport tubes. So the industry is starting to respond. And then to the actual test kits itself, you know, our goal of double official was to double and, and, and scale from a million to then five million to 10 million. Uh, also, the stockpile has been important because otherwise, in the past, they've been involved in other outbreaks like Zika and SARS, and the industry doesn't actually scale up not knowing what the outbreak is going to be. So again, you need some government intervention. The stockpile is done uh, to order tests that we can have available for these ongoing outbreaks we're now seeing as we head into July. You know the next slide? One of the other challenges has been the availability of labs in the US. So as we work each state by state, county by county, some uh, cities, states just weren't set up to do this level of testing. Uh, I show a case study, for example, in Ohio here, where we worked with the governor. Each governor typically set up a task force, but then say to them, let's identify three or four labs uh, maybe spread across the state that we can work with, that we can support, that we can validate into the setting, that we can get people trained in, staff, clinicians, and then scale that up in order to scale the testing at the state, state level. So this has continued on uh, across the different states um, to start initially at the use case of, of patients uh, in hospitals, but is quickly and rapidly expanding. Go to the next slide. So where we are today is, you know, where we have symptomatic patients, the objective is fairly straightforward. We need to quickly diagnose, at the moment, typically, is that a COVID, uh, is it a COVID infection with the virus, uh, it, or have they had the, the virus? And typically, we're doing that with this molecular and antigen testing. What's also beginning to go on is population-based screening. So to the example I quoted in New York and other cities are looking at, well, what is the spread of the virus? And is it going on in certain populations, be those uh, high-risk populations, so a high a population within a city, or perhaps in the targeted group, perhaps we take a particular area, a care home, a meat fat packing factory, uh, a renal diagnosis area. We're beginning to see uh, back to work in different use cases. Thermo Fisher itself has started to test some of our employees in the pharma manufacturing environments that we have, in our field service engineers and support application chemists who are on site with our customers, so a targeted group. And then finally, we're going to need to look at how do we test for vaccine treatment and development. How do we get a baseline of who we're testing before? How do we test the efficacy of the vaccine? So these are some of the different use cases now that are expanding very quickly that we need to think about. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of why that's important uh, in my final slide. You have the next slide? So clearly the challenge we all have at the moment is, is how do we keep the economy open, open up and, and get, get, get going again? 
And, you know, the reality is, whether you call it the new normal, this is the normal, you know, COVID is still circulating and it is a threat until really we have vaccines uh, are fully scaled and we're going to have therapies that make the disease less deadly. So we'll talk later in the, in the next speaker about, you know, what is the time frame, but, it, but at least as a placeholder, if we say that's some 12 months away, uh, you know, we have to live with this period now of the open economy. And the major challenge, as I talked to before, is this asymptomatic carriers. Just not knowing how much the virus is circulating, even if we're seeing it's testing and we're circulating in young populations, that's going to spread to the older populations, which are all or immune compromised, which also is going to push up the deaths. You know, the other challenge we've got, and, you know, we suffer as well as some official, we put temperature screening at our workplaces. I know so many workplaces have done that. But the challenge is, again, because of the lack of symptoms, if you look, actually 70% of patients sick enough to be hospitalized for COVID did not have any fever. Uh, that's because, you know, there's not an immune response creating the fever. And so, you know, temperature screening, unfortunately, is missing at least by this estimate, 80 to 6 percent of infected individuals coming back into a workplace. And so even if you end up to testing and screening done daily, if you do the statistics and the maths, that's you're only going to identify about half of the infected individuals, and you've got delays uh, from the period from infection to symptoms that I showed on the earlier chart. So unfortunately, we've got a lot of challenges here that you know, testing can help across the modalities, but it clearly we come back to other mitigations as well. So, you know, my final thoughts on the uh, next slide here, sort of factors to consider. Um, you know, as we saw at the outbreak, firstly, regulatory oversight is incredibly important. The FDA's guidance that was issued back at the end of February provided the necessary flexibility was a turning point to increase capacity. We continue to work very closely with the FDA uh, over this period to get further amendments to our initial approval. But we and the private sector need to continue to have that flexibility to bring in new innovations, modifications to the testing protocol, for example, into saliva, looking at new protocols like pooling, and that requires FDA flexibility. The second is test coverage. So the reimbursement, the federal government on June 23rd gave additional guidance. And particularly what we're looking at here is the cost coverage of the test can't only cover those individuals with signs or symptoms, but medically relevant is also asymptomatic individuals who've been known or suspected recent exposure. If we're going to contain the virus, that's incredibly important that insurance covers that. And it needs to be rapid. At the moment, it requires a doctor's signature off, which is slowing down the process. So that's another change we should consider check looking at. In terms of supplies, I think the industry has made good progress on that. The challenge is, I mean, if we look at outside the U.S., you know, some of the demand at the moment is going down in Europe. It was going down in many parts of the U.S. Do we say, okay, we're done, and the industry scales back and goes to regular business? Or do we prepare for the fall? I would argue, actually, we need to prepare for the fall. We've got to stockpile some more here. And we need to think about what are we stocking for the fall? And I'll come back to that in my final point. You know, part of testing that we've also stood up was to try to keep sick people from overwhelming the hospitals. And part of that is access to different testing points to where you test. And that includes for us home testing. If someone who is suspected or being uh, infected with another or uh, close to another infected individual, you'd really want to isolate them at home, send them a test kit, which requires saliva testing or some home testing mentality. And, and so we've got to get that approved and through regulatory. That's part of another innovation. We do need this contact tracing. So um, we know where the infections occur. We can see the test. We have to then isolate within a short period of time people who've been in touch. And then finally, we have to think about the flu season. You know, as was mentioned actually in the outcome, not only do we've got the current virus, we could get other viruses that are from a testing genetic point of view, 
relatively easy to design and add other swine flus or flu A, flu B, other viruses onto the genetic panel. But we need to prepare for that and decide, yes, we're going to have a monitoring system, a surveillance going on, so that we're prepared for the winter season and not get overwhelmed. So those are my comments. So I'll pass it back to you, Cynthia, and I think we're going to open up for questions at the end if people have questions on what I've said so far. Great. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. And um, I know that at least I have a couple of questions for you at the end of the program, and I'm, I'm sure others do as well. Um, so next slide, please. Lindsay? Thanks so much. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Rajiv Venkaya. Uh, Dr. Venkaya is president of the Global Vaccines Business Unit at Cicada Pharmaceuticals, where he, led, where he leads a vertically integrated business developing vaccines for dengue, neurovirus, and Zika. He serves as an independent member of the board of the Coalition for Ep Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, which is funding and coordinating several initiatives related to the virus that causes COVID. He's also on the board of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative and is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Venkaya is currently co-leading Takeda's response to the COVID-19 outbreak, given his previous experience with the White House, as the White House Special Assistant to the President for Biodefense, where he was the principal author of the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza. He led the execution of the Companion Implementation Plan and he conceived of the strategy for early coordinated implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions to slow the spread of a pandemic virus. This is known as flattening the curve, which we heard quite a bit about over the last few months. Um, the strategy was described in guidelines on community mitigation of pandemic influenza that are being implemented or considered by governments around the world to slow transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19. Prior to joining Takeda, Dr. Venkaya served as Director of Vaccine Delivery at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Health Program, where he was responsible for the foundation's top two priorities, uh, polio eradication and the introduction of new vaccines into developing countries through Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. We look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say about the current COVID-19 vaccine uh, therapeutic uh, development work, and um, I'm going to ask Lindsay to pull up your slides, and if you can take yourself the call is all yours now. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. And uh, thank you, Ed. And thanks to the leadership of the Personalized Medicine Caucus for inviting Mark and I to speak with you today. Uh, I also want to thank Mark for providing such a fantastic overview of one of the most important issues that we're confronting in the midst of this pandemic, and that is the issue of situational awareness, which is so critical to control a pandemic virus of this nature. I'm going to be talking about other tools that are, are very important that you've been hearing a lot about, specifically vaccines and treatments. I'll try to give you a, a high level sense as to the current landscape in both of these areas and what we can expect to come, and also try to, um, to, to address some uh, either myths or ambitions that may or may not be realized. I'll try to give you a balanced picture of what we're looking at. And then uh, if we have some time, I'm going to spend a little bit uh, of my presentation speaking about where we are with the pandemic and the control interventions that are being used across the U.S. in, your, in all of your states and what we can do to uh, strengthen our reopening plans and, uh, and keep our, our cities safe without shutting down the economy or keeping it shut down. So let me first talk about uh, the differences between vaccines and therapeutics, just, just so we're all on the same page. So when we talk about vaccines, we're talking about uh, something that is given to healthy individuals to prevent them from contracting an infection. And you can find with many vaccines that they are used across the life course. Most vaccines are used in young children because that's where you see a very high incidence of vaccine preventable diseases. But for things like cervical cancer, we'll see vaccines used in adolescence. Uh, we'll see influenza vaccines accused, uh, used uh, across the entire spectrum, particularly in, in, the, in the older adult population where we see more severe disease resulting from, from flu. But the key principle here is that you're immunizing large populations of individuals. The reality is that you can't predict which of those people will be exposed to the infectious disease of interest that you're using the vaccine for. And because you can't predict that, you immunize everybody. 
that does two things for you. One is that it ensures that every individual is protected, but it also gives you in the community a level of what we call population immunity, which means that whenever a virus uh, has contact with a person, that individual is less likely to be infected. And when you spread that impact across an entire population, you can make it very hard for a virus to even gain a foothold in a community at all. This is exactly what we hope to do in developing a, a virus against this coronavirus. Now, one of the things you may not realize is that when you're developing vaccines, it is important to conduct very large clinical trials where you compare the vaccine against a placebo to see how effective it is at preventing the infection. Now, remember I said you can't predict who is going to be exposed to, in this case, the virus versus who is not. And so that's one reason why you have to immunize tens of thousands of individuals in, say, a phase three vaccine clinical trial, expecting that some small proportion of them will get infected. And then when you compare between the placebo group and the vaccine group, you can tell in a statistically significant way that the vaccine is providing benefit in terms of preventing the infection. The other reason we need to do these very large clinical trials is that there are certain side effects of vaccines that only show up when they're, they're quite rare. They only show up when you immunize a lot of people. And of course, when you launch a vaccine, ultimately you will be immunizing millions of individuals. But you'd like to know if there is a safety issue or what we call an adverse event that rarely occurs. You'd like to know that before you launch a vaccine into large numbers of people. And this is the other reason why immunizing in a clinical trial, tens of thousands of individuals gives you a better chance of finding out whether you have uh, a safety issue that you need to be aware of. If you have a safety issue, it could be something like redness in the arm where you inject a person. It could be fevers or, or chills. It could possibly rarely be something more serious. It doesn't mean that the vaccine shouldn't be used or that it's not good. It's just that you want to be able to explain to people the benefit and the risk profile of that vaccine when you launch it so that nobody is surprised. Now let's compare the, the vaccine profile to treatments or therapeutics. Now, it, in, in, this is going to sound obvious, but in the case of treatments, you're talking about giving something to a person who has some form of illness. And so you can identify that population. You can point to somebody and say, you have this illness and I have a treatment that hopefully is going to help you. Again, that's not the case with vaccines because you don't know who's gonna be exposed to the infectious disease or not. Uh, because you can focus your treatment on a certain population of individuals, it makes it easier to assess the effectiveness of the treatment in a clinical trial. So you don't have to capture large numbers of healthy people in your clinical trial. You go and you find individuals that have that disease, and then you, uh, in a relatively small clinical trial, can compare placebo or the standard of care against treatment. So this makes it faster and less expensive uh, and frankly more straightforward to do clinical trials of, of treatments. Now this is important because it translates to the to timeline differences in how long it normally takes to develop drugs or treatments versus vaccines. In the case of drugs, um, for certain conditions, including life-threatening conditions or uh, certain oncology drugs, if you have a uh, a medicine that in very small clinical trials, early clinical trials, shows that it could have a significant impact, you can move very quickly to life insure of that treatment because, uh, because you've, you've been able to show a high magnitude of effect. The other benefit is that when you have, or I put benefit in quotes, the other thing that makes it easier is that when you have a person with an illness, you can tolerate a certain level of side effects as long as they're not so severe that they make the, the treatment worse than the, than the actual disease itself. And this is the other important distinction between treatments and vaccines. In the case of treatments, you may be able to, to tolerate a certain level of side effect. In the case of vaccines, because you're immunizing healthy individuals, even potentially healthy children, you have a very, very low tolerance for adverse events. Okay, so let me, let me now switch gears and talk about where we are in the landscape of development of treatments and vaccines for 
COVID-19. I'm going to start with treatments. I'm going to stay on this slide uh, and just at a high level explain where things stand. Then I'll turn to vaccines, and I do have a graphic that gives you a, a sense for the, for the timelines. Now, in the case of treatments, uh, of course, this is a, a virus that is completely new. We had never seen this particular virus, although we had seen related viruses, uh, the SARS virus, the MERS virus, in the past. But we hadn't actually gone far enough in research and development to develop specific treatments for those diseases. And so we were essentially, we were essentially starting from scratch in developing drugs to treat people with illness. Now, I would say there are three waves of products that we're going to see uh, reaching, reaching patients who are ill. The first is the set of products that are already being used for other diseases that we have reason to believe might have an impact on COVID-19 infection. Here you can think about um, antivirals for HIV. Uh, there's one called Calitra that has been tried. You can also think about a drug called dexamethasone, which is a steroid, an immunosuppressant that has been used for a very long time in, uh, in a variety of, of, of diseases, for decades actually. We really know a lot about it. And it's recently been shown in a clinical trial to reduce mortality in individuals who are in an intensive care unit on a ventilator. It's reduced mortality by 35%, which is an extraordinary impact of a drug. And this is a generic drug that's widely available. So that's an example of an available drug today that we've been able to test immediately, and it has already shown that there's benefit, and it is being used in clinical practice today. The second, there are a whole host of other drugs that um, fit the criteria of being on the market today that are being, quote, unquote, repurposed for COVID-19 infection. Those are drugs that work on the immune system. They may be used for other viruses. They may be um, used uh, for other conditions, like to reduce acid in the stomach, and, and we think that they may have a benefit here. The second wave are uh, drugs that are in the pipeline being developed for other reasons, but that we are repurposing, um, in this case, for COVID-19. And there are, um, these drugs are going to take a little bit longer to, to get through clinical development, but you can, you can envision having data to support their use potentially as soon as later this year or early next year. Um, two examples that have shown success early are the antiviral called remdesivir, uh, which, you, which is made by a company called Gilead, and there's another drug called uh, uh, favipiravir, which is an antiviral for influenza. These drugs had not yet been licensed. They were for Ebola and influenza, respectively, but when COVID emerged, they were immediately tested against COVID and there are, uh, we've now shown that, or it's been shown that remdesivir does have some benefit. And the other drug, the antiviral for flu, uh, favipiravir, um, potentially has efficacy. The third category of drugs are those that have not even gone into humans yet. And this includes all of the brand new treatments that we're designing specifically for COVID-19. Most of these treatments are going to take longer to reach people who are sick because it just takes a certain amount of time to develop these products and go through the necessary um, pre-clinical and clinical testing. But there are a couple of exceptions, and those are in the category of antibodies. I think as everybody knows, when you have an infection, one of the things your body does is it develops antibodies that circulate in the bloodstream that bind to the, the thing that you're trying to protect yourself against, in, case, in this case a virus, and, it, and those antibodies can prevent the virus from entering cells. Now, there are what we call monoclonal antibodies, which are produced in, um, in, in silver tanks, stainless steel tanks, uh, that can, can very specifically target uh, parts of the virus. There are other ways of deriving antibodies from the bloodstream of individuals who have recovered from COVID-19 infection. You may have heard that in, in hospitals around the world, people are taking the plasma of individuals that have recovered successfully, they're purifying the antibody portion of that plasma and then giving it to people who have active COVID-19 infection. And there are signs that this can reduce the severity of illness. Takeda has actually been, my company has been very involved in this because we have uh, a plasma, significant plasma um, operation where on an ongoing basis, we collect plasma and we purify this antibody fraction and we give it to people with certain uh, rare diseases or immune conditions. 
In this case, getting a little bit of background noise, I just can go on. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. In this case, I'll pause for a second. Hi, we're getting a little bit of background noise. If you're not speaking, could you please mute your line? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so in this case, what we what we're doing is we're we're collecting plasma using our existing infrastructure collection sites from people who have recovered from COVID-19, and we're purifying that plasma and the antibodies, and then we are preparing a product that can be given. It's being tested. It will be tested soon in a uh, clinical trial in hopes that it will reduce the severity of uh, COVID-19 infection. We're not doing this alone. We have actually formed an alliance uh, called the COVID-19, COVIG-19 Alliance with a number of other companies to uh, work together to produce a single unbranded product, uh, antibody product that can be used for this purpose. Um, this is really unprecedented in the, in the industry. If you um, or your constituents are interested in learning more about it, there's a campaign that has a lot of celebrities involved with it called The Fight Is In Us. If they go to thefightisinus.org, they can find out ways to, uh, to donate their own plasma to help others. I think this is a very exciting uh, opportunity to make a difference soon in COVID-19 infections. For these monoclonal antibodies and for this antibody approach that I just mentioned, um, we're expecting uh, data to come out in the next few months, and in both categories of treatments, we could expect them to that sufficient data to be available for them to be used before the end of the year. Now, let me um, turn to vaccines because this is uh, probably the the number one thing people want to uh, to know about uh, to to protect large populations, including those who are very vulnerable, and ultimately stop the pandemic. If we can go to the next slide. There are a whole host of, uh, of vaccines that are in development now. Actually, over uh, 200 organizations have announced vaccine programs. What you see here is a snapshot of a few of the programs that are fairly far along in, in vaccine development. In many cases, they, they have partnered with large pharmaceutical companies um, to help with the development and manufacturing scale-up. Um, just to orient you, you can see um, the, the calendar dates at the top, uh, which, which carry us through 2020. Uh, then you can see uh, six companies listed on the left. And then the dots represent the phases of development, phase uh, one in red uh, and phase two in blue and so on. The, the most important uh, dot that you would, you would see here is the green uh, dot or bar, which represents the start of the large phase three clinical trial. That's the final stage of development of a, of a vaccine. This is based on publicly disclosed information. Uh, we don't have all the information on the slide here, but suffice it to say that in the U.S., a number of vaccines are going into phase three development toward the end, uh, in the second half, I should say, of 2020. This is extraordinarily fast for vaccine development. It normally takes 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine. To go from identification of the virus in January to a phase three clinical trial within the same calendar year is extraordinarily ambitious. If everything goes right, and I want to emphasize that everything has to go right, it is possible, although again, very aspirational, to have supply of vaccine in the U.S. before the end of this calendar year. If you were uh, a betting person, and you looked at all the, the things that could come up to go wrong, uh, as it were, um, in, in the process of development and manufacturing scale-up. And a lot of these issues that can arise do happen in manufacturing because you have to very carefully ensure that as you scale up your manufacturing that you're not in any way altering the profile of the, the product itself, then that's going to delay things further. So I think realistically, the original timelines that were set where we would have uh, vaccine in meaningful quantities in the U.S. in the first half of next year is probably a more likely scenario. And I think that this could actually happen because we have so many companies that are working on this. We have multiple shots on goal um, to, uh, to, to hopefully um, realize this, uh, this, uh, this 
success, if you will. So that's uh, at a high level uh, where we are in terms of timelines for vaccines. Um, I'm happy. I'm going to I'm going to stop talking about vaccines for a moment, and I'm happy to take questions about that. But I want to shift gears again and talk briefly about the public health measures that are being taken in your states to control transmission of the virus. And, and to do that, I want to begin by illustrating a, a concept, which is uh, the, public, uh, the combination of public health measures that we're using to reduce transmission. I consider these to be like layers of Swiss cheese. None of them is perfect in and of itself. They all have holes in them. But if you put them together, then you can actually create quite a, an effective shield. And if we can just illustrate this, Cynthia, if we can um, go through the next few slides just so people can see the concept. Um, so the idea is that nothing's perfect. Next slide. And next slide. And we're just going to just keep running through the next few slides. So this is social distancing, careful hygiene, staying home when you're sick, and then the testing and tracing that Mark talked about, and finally, cloth masks on everyone. And we'll talk more about masks in just a moment, but the idea is that if you, and next slide, if you put everything together, you can create an effective shield. Now, if you're going to take some of those interventions away, if you're going to have people come out of their homes and interact in the community, go to stores, go to restaurants, you're removing layers. You're removing layers of Swiss cheese. And in concept, the idea would be if you're going to remove those layers, you would replace them with something else to try to re keep transmission down in the community. And if we can go to the next slide, there are a suite of tools that you can use to replace those layers. There's been a lot of controversy and, frankly, some um, uh, not ideal communication around the use of masks early in the pandemic. But we now recognize that if you put a mask on everybody, not to prevent the individual from contracting the virus, but to prevent them from transmitting the virus to somebody else if they happen to be carrying the virus but don't have symptoms, that alone could significantly reduce transmission in a community. The second I'm not going to talk about because Mark did um, at length, and that is the idea of testing and tracing those individuals that are ill, but also using testing to give you an understanding of what's happening in the community. And this is in the third bucket, the idea that once you've reduced infection transmission, you want to have early warning when the virus is coming back so that you can potentially reinstate certain public health measures. And, and that is based on testing, but it could be testing in different settings. For example, there's a, uh, uh, emerging work going on on wastewater testing, wastewater in the community or wastewater potentially from individual facilities to give you early warning that the virus is reemerging that can then lead you to do individual testing to, in an effort to, to uh, contain that, uh, that outbreak. The idea here is that if you can replace the layers you took away with these layers, that you will be able to reopen cities, but in a safe way that allows the economy to keep going without taking on significant risk of the virus uh, returning. So with that, uh, Cynthia, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there and happy to take questions with Mark. Terrific. Thank you so much, Rajiv. We really um, appreciate that presentation. I know that um, there will be some questions. So um, to allow for you to, to ask your question directly, um, we ask you to just go ahead and unmute your line and um, just make sure you introduce yourself um, so folks know who are speaking. Um, are there any questions? Okay. So while folks are taking themselves off mute, Oh, go ahead. Cynthia, hey, this is Liz O'Day. I'm the CEO and founder of Olaris and recently appointed to the board of the PMC. I have a, a quick question for both Mark and Rajiv that maybe they can add their comments on here. Okay. You know, we're kind of, you both alluded to that we're, we're in catch-up mode right here, right now. So as scientists and as industry leaders, you know, we've, we're trying to sort of bring together our technology and our collective intellect here to figure out what's going on and how we can best diagnose and, and treat this disease. I'm wondering if both of you could add your thoughts and comments about the roles of biomarkers here. Um, on both the therapeutic side, you know, Rajiv, like we've got these three layers of drugs that you talked about that will be rolled out. I think of anything that we've learned over the last, you know, years and decades is that no one medicine works for every individual. Um, and so as people are repurposing drugs, as people are developing new drugs, 
what is the role or what do you think should be the role of increased sort of biomarker discovery efforts and I would, you know, encourage that that go beyond just genomics because I think of anything we, we've learned over the last years is that genomics rarely tells us, you know, the full answer, but what we can be encouraged about is that we do actually have the technology to help untangle, you know, why some people benefit from covalescent antibody treatment and why others don't. And then, then maybe a similar question to Mark, you know, as we're figuring out ways to sort of diagnose people. Are there other types of diagnostic tools that we can be developed that can detect this disease earlier, detect those asymptomatic folks, figure out why, why they don't get the, um, the, the disease to develop, um, and so on and so forth? Mark, yeah, uh, it's Mark. Maybe I can start. I mean, it, there's no doubt in the response we started with the simple biomarker, which was let's detect the virus. It's a relatively, from a genetic point of view, simple virus. We have three genes across it, and so those are the right biomarkers. The immune response seems to be very complicated, right? So the markers are, is it an immediate response, IgM? Is a protein response? Is it an IgG? Um, need other tools. We've used the basic tools, antibodies. We see clinicians starting to use tools like mass spectrometry, which are more universal in their response to what are the biomarkers. And then we've got other innate response, the sort of T cell response that may, you know, it turns out some individuals are responding without, you know, probably younger individuals on that T cell. So there's a lot yet we don't know about the immune response. It would incredibly be helpful if we could find biomarkers and do that discovery program and then, you know, apply those to diagnostic tools. The challenge is always making them robust, but at least we should be doing the discovery now of what are the tools that may open the aperture and actually re respond in future to not just this specific virus, but other emerging threats uh, for the immune system. And I would just add to that by saying in, in the, on the treatment side, if you have a, say, a cytokine or other mediator profile of severe illness, COVID illness, that can be a clue as to what treatments uh, that are already in development or available on the market uh, might work. And that could uh, be enough to convince you to take a product into a clinical trial. On the vaccine side, the, the biomarker that is what we would call a correlate of protection, meaning that if you give a vaccine and you see this type of antibody rise, and I, you know, I, this would typically be a neutralizing antibody, uh, meaning that it, it prevents the virus from doing its thing in, in the lab, that, is a, that uh, unlocks uh, so much speed in, in development. The problem is that, because you don't have to conduct a large clinical uh, efficacy trials, the problem is you need to do those big clinical efficacy trials to define what those antibodies are and what those correlates are, and you forget there. But if you do get there, then every subsequent vaccine development program is uh, significantly uh, enhanced. Yeah, so, so that's, I guess, one of the points. I think, like, biobanking right now is going to help us so much um, in the future by collecting, you know, the blood, the plasma, the serum, whatever, on the patients that we're treating now and going through these trials uh, will only accelerate whatever sort of happens next. So I just you know if there's ways that we can encourage um, the, those types of initiatives through public-private partnership, I think it's something to consider. Yeah, that's a great point. Great, thank this you. This is a uh, Burns, Burns Black, I'll just kind of a follow-up on that. Um, so I'm Director of Precision Medicine at a community hospital in Cincinnati, and we're doing a lot of work with pharmacogenomics, precision medicine. Um, I guess the follow-up to the last discussion is is there any coordination between the ongoing clinical trials or even just the biobanking that was spoken of to at least identify some biomarkers that could distinguish the different types of treatment? Like you say, if they have cytokines, dexamethasone maybe is a good target versus something else. Is, is there any coordination across the companies of biomarkers or biobanking with their ongoing clinical trials? So I, I, I can't speak to biobanking and, uh, and biomarkers specifically, but there are a couple of very uh, successful collabor collaborations in industry um, uh, underway now. One is led by the NIH. It's the active consortium, and the other is called COVID R&D, 
uh, which is uh, in, uh, led by and comprised only of, of industry partners to collaborate in the um, pre-competitive space and potentially in the competitive space where, uh, where possible. So um, I, I can't answer the question. I, I would not be surprised if that, in fact, I would expect that some of that is happening, but I can't speak to specific examples. Great, thank you. And thank you both for your questions. Um, we are actually at time. And Lindsay, can I have the last slide, please? Um, I know that many of you um, may have had some questions you didn't have time to ask. Um, you can feel free to email those to me and I'll make sure that they um, are sent to, to Mark and to Rajiv um, for a response if we're, we're able to get um, an answer for you. Um, and before I sign off, I just wanna thank um, our speakers again for their really informative presentations and also um, say that if your congressional office is not part of the um, Personalized Medicine Caucus, but you'd like to be, uh, please also reach out to me for more information. And then finally, um, I also want to thank my PMC colleagues, Lindsay Stevens, Chris Wells, David Davenport, and the PM Caucus co-chair staff, Ediola Edesina, Connor Sheehy, Sylvia Lee, and Landon Zunda for all of their help with the briefing. Um, thank you all for joining, and I hope you all are well and you stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.